the other thing with with people who and this was maybe one of the questions you wanted to cover is if you can do more exercises right you're going to get different activation patterns and there may be for whatever reason when you even if you go all out on a, on squats for instance mm -hmm. there may be certain muscles of the quad there's actually study that's demonstrated this different areas and let me just give a brief primer too because you're right this is one of the the questions yeah. that i had and um so for people who don't know again about a dc training the idea is you rotate through exercises so you might have it's like an a and b workout in the most simplistic terms and you'll have a1 b1 a2 b2 a3 b3 so essentially you'll pick three primary exercises per muscle group and over the weeks you add weight as much as you can if it continues to stall out you rotate it out now dante who again if you guys don't follow him on instagram or anything like that i would recommend you do he has some good posts there but dante talks about how you want to find these core exercises, which I, of course, agree with, and get stronger over the years. But he'll also talk about how he's tried like a million different exercises. And this is where I had a little debate, you know, in quotes with him, where he feels that every time you're doing these new exercises, he will look for these mechanical advantages, and he'll call it getting weird with it. And I kind right. of wanted to talk to him. I was glad I, I got to briefly chat with him online about it, about like what what does that mean for one? And two, <laughs> how much is that really helping like if somebody has done you know pull-ups barbell rows uh, cable rows and deadlifts and they have over the years gone back to those exercises year after year and gotten stronger and stronger how much benefit are you really going to see from picking these like new stranger exercises and my argument was that you will definitely get stronger at them no question mm. because you're going to have maybe even months of you know neurological gains where you're getting better at the exercise you know i I'm, I'm sure my legs haven't grown during these, this pandemic because I've been dieting. And yet, because I started working out at home again, I've been using my crappy leg extension leg curl I have there. And every week, in the last 12 weeks, I've gotten stronger. But I guarantee you, I haven't put on any leg size. And in fact, I've probably even lost a little bit of leg size. So that's kind of where my debate with that is. So I guess that's almost two topics in one, the getting weird with it and the exercise variation. So I don't know if you want to touch on that. Well, it actually needs to be, th well, there needs to be maybe four. The thing I was going to say that's connected with that is if you uh, just do one exercise per, uh, let's say you do three sets of one exercise, um, you're going to have the roughly, roughly similar activation patterns. And there's a, um, an article, it's a study that's oft quoted, and I cited my Fortitude training book, actually been around for a while. Um, by Fonseca et al. And they had, I think, four groups. They varied intensity, but it was only like they compared with moving between six and 10 rep max versus just an eight rep max continuous. And that's not much of a variation. I like it went from six to 15. Yeah. Um, but in, so the two, they, they had that variation. They ended up having four groups. But the most important finding of the study really was in two of those groups, so half of the subjects, they just squatted. And the other half, they did like a deadlift, a leg press, squat, and maybe it was a knee extension. They did four exercises. And only in those groups that were using a, a variety of exercises did they see significant growth in all four heads of the quadriceps. Right. So that's, that's sort of the idea, especially with someone who has a weak muscle group, is that you want a different activation pattern. And especially if someone has, has a hard time, a lot of times those weak muscle groups are the ones that don't pump up very well. Yeah. The person doesn't feel a good, quote unquote, mind-muscle connection with them. You can even watch sometimes people, and like back training is an obvious one. You can watch people, I've seen this in videos with pros before, who are moving massive weights because they're just big, strong people. And maybe they have really large triceps and they've learned how to be strong, but their backs aren't that great. And you can see just just from how they're doing their back exercises, why they're not getting good growth in the lower lats, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, so there's something to say for execution. So you want that variety to ensure act good activation. And if you're someone who hasn't found good activation with the standard, traditional, like barbell, basic exercises, that's what Dante means about getting weird with it. And what, what that means from a physiological standpoint is you're evoking a different activation pattern that may call upon those motor units which typically don't get used um, very often or even maybe maybe they never get even activated in, some, in, in many cases or maybe just for a rep at the very end of a very hard set. Mm -hmm. um, you can do the same kind of thing by like changing rep tempo. 
I have a whole talk that I give on the mind muscle connection. Very, there's some there's some studies that actually point in the direction of things you can do, like in, initiating the the motion with the muscle that you're trying to target. Um, think about that. Going not going too fast or too heavy. Yeah. Um, uh, so once you're training it, you know, above like 80 or 90 percent of one rep max, you're just de facto going to start using a shitload of muscle because you're near a max effort. So you're right. going to use all the muscle you can that you used in that max effort. So training lighter is a better way to do that. So that's what the getting weird with the thing is. But you actually, there's the, the thing that you, I don't think you didn't mention here, and I don't think was mentioned on that thread on the discussion board where I saw you ask, you had a discussion with Dante, is that if you're not gaining weight, if you've been training for you know two or three years, mm-hmm. you're trying to bring up a weak muscle group, and you're not literally gaining body weight at the sure. same time, you're just pissing in the wind. It's right. just not going to happen. You need to have... That needs to be there, and that's that's the biggest thing. So, like this this the paper that I mentioned, or the Fonseca paper. Well, those people were were growing anyway. Mm-hmm. So you've got you know, the, that's why that's why they use untrained subjects because you know you're going to yeah. get a get a good effect in the first place, and then you can maybe see whether there's a difference between groups that are supplemented with this, that, and the other, or different frequencies or what have you. Well, I think um, that's such an important point in general for all these training studies because all these studies that show like, oh, this group was better. And it's like, to me, it's like, if you are training and you're pushing yourself hard and you're in a calorie surplus, you're, I mean, you're going to gain lean body mass, even if you're not training, obviously it's not a ideal ratio, but just training, you're going to gain lean body mass. And something that I've said for a while now that I, I almost never hear anybody else bring up is that obviously if we're talking like just crap routine, I'm not talking about that, but if you have a reasonably good routine, my thoughts are, these better routines will get you to the end goal faster, but they're not necessarily going to change the end goal. I mean, I think, you know, Fortu Training, amazing program, DC Training, great program, John Meadows Routines. I think if somebody is doing any of them for 15 years, you're going to get to whatever your natural limit is. Maybe one of them is going to get you there a little faster. I mean, that's, that's my thoughts, at least. Well, I mean, you're, you're going to get to some plateau. So... Yeah. Let, let's say, let's go back to that Dama study where some people do better. You see this at the beginning, like their trajectories are like, so I'll do it with the axis going this way. So like, let's say they get really good growth with a high frequency and not so good growth with the lower frequency. Right. So those, you follow out over the years and they end up plateauing because higher frequency for them is just a better overall stimulus for muscle growth. All other things being equal, they'll still plateau. It, they may be very, very close to one another. It may be that those trajectories, you know, they end up like doing one of these numbers, you know, and they reach the same same top. But I think, like, let's say that, um, let's say someone does one of John's programs, one of the higher volume ones. He's got some higher frequency ones. Yeah. And the way they execute that uh, is such that they're just training maybe too close to failure on some of those feeder sets that he has doing. They just love to train hard. They've got the mental constitution. And, I, and I've been, I was guilty of this for like literally decades, at least yeah. a decade. You you tell me to do a hundred. At one point, I was doing twenty sets of twenty reps on the squats. Oof. I just I'm going to force growth, and I just I was doing that. It's ridiculous. Like yeah. there's and there's no way I do that. But I just and I did the cybergenics program. I don't know if you know, but like that's just we carried yeah. it out the way it was written. Yeah. That's just that's ridiculousness. But I would do that, and we kept up. We did it for the full eight weeks or whatever it was. <laughs> way too much. I did it. I did it twice actually. Right. So, so that person might be training very suboptimally, and they're still going to have reached some some plateau. But then, if they drop back, and let's say for them a lower frequency or a lower volume, I think they would end up someplace higher. Now, the question is, I I would say that the as long as the training is well structured and, like you said, it's it's hard, and maybe of course over the course of years they're going to figure out, you know, maybe I shouldn't be sore all the time. Mm-hmm. Or when I, when I do a deload, I end up growing really well and feeling really good. They'll eventually settle into a different program, probably. They'll, yeah. they'll, they will self-optimize their programming if they're paying attention, not just like mindlessly beating themselves up in the gym. But right. the thing but again, that I, though, I... Even with my example, I'm assuming a significant calorie surplus. So I'm thinking somebody who over the years has thing. bulked up, cut down, bulked up, cut down... If you take, even if somebody responds better, like they, they absolutely, if we somehow just know this person responds better to higher frequency, I still think if they're doing a reasonably um, structured routine with one times a week frequency, 
but over 10 years of natural lifting, they've bulked up to 250 and then they've cut down. I mean, I think they're still going to have 95 plus percent of their potential there just from because when you're bulking up, I mean, that's the stimulus along with your training. Right. You know, I, I really just think that that's not that the training details don't matter. I do think you can maybe get the end result faster, but I just think that calorie surplus over an extended period of time with progressive overload is, is like 95% of it. That's a lot of it. Yeah. I think here's the thing that will, and this, you see this in the Dama study. Again, it's just one study, but you saw some, some people when there was an extraordinary difference between the two frequency um, uh, uh, conditions, two or three times per week versus five times a week. Mm -hmm. Some people was about the same. Yeah. Some people it was the other way around. So some people it would make almost no difference whether they trained you know, once a week versus once every five days or even twice a week, maybe. It wouldn't matter. Like, they're going to grow equally from both. And then some people would make a big difference. Right. And I think also there are some people who, like, just can't put the food down or they're simply, and I find this, this is just something I found with clients and many people I've spoken with is that, like, no one, you're a bodybuilder. You, like, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's probably a psychological, maybe genetically predisposition, probably a family of origin, sociological, it's a biopsychosocial phenomenon to some degree with a genetic component, I would imagine, that leads someone to become a bodybuilder. It's because you like to have a badass looking physique. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to be a fat ass. Right. Some people want to, like, they like being as big as possible. And some guys will wear, like, you know, three shirts to the gym because they just want to take up as much size yeah. and you know block out the sun if they possibly could <laughs> but most people don't want to be fat they don't right. want to to maybe put on the amount of body fat that they might need to to get the extra 10 pounds of muscle and hold it yeah so um i think there's something to say say for that where you take sure. That's you fair. know there's always that the whole we, we've talked about this before probably and you've seen it you know brought up many times you take the two twins you know, and like have one that just becomes super sloppy and bulks to 300 pounds. And the other yeah. one wants to, you know, look good for the ladies and be beach ready for a photo shoot anytime. And who's going to make most gains over three years? And I think it would depend if we're going to get a little nuanced here on which set of twins you're talking about. Yeah. So just like some people respond better from different overall from training in general. Some people respond much better from a higher frequency versus a lower frequency. Some people would probably be better with lower volume. Like let, let's say that you are someone for what for whatever reason you get you've got a good mind muscle connection, um, and you can and you don't suffer a whole lot of muscle damage. You can you can do a lot of high volume training and get effective reps, stopping two or three reps shy of failure. Whereas someone else, in order to evoke the stimulus you've just got to push those sets to failure each and every time. So that former person is going to be able to do a higher volume and that for them that's going to be a much much better way to go. So you take, you take those two twins and now take the interaction of whether one twin is willing to eat a lot and not eat a lot. And you can imagine if, you, if you'd look at the ends of things you could do right, mm -hmm. take the twin who picks the right training regime and who is just like, I don't care how, how gross I look. When I diet down, you know, to win my state show five years from now, I'm going to be indomitable. I'm going to be right. just, I'm going to still be squatting five and pulling seven plates from the floor and, and everything else. And then take someone who does everything wrong. Like they try to stay in single percentage body fat and they use the wrong training because they like to get a pump in the gym when really they should be trying to get stronger and they don't tr train to failure. You can imagine a pretty wide disparity there. So and so, some sure. people it won't matter. There's probably some will, won't make much of a difference, no matter how much they bulk. They just gain fat and not not much muscle. You know, you're nodding like God. That's me. I got all. <laughs> I'm like all those things in the wrong spot. Well, I and did I, force myself up to like when I was after maybe eleven to twelve years, and I really hadn't made much progress. Like you know, after the last few years, and so I said, okay, I'm going to do one instead of like a typical yearly bulk and cut, like maybe nine months and three months. I was like, all right, let me do it over two years. So I bulked up to 220. And, you know, at my height, 220 is still not that big. I mean, you know, by normal people standards, it's big, oh, but I'm 6'1. Oh, so, okay. you know, it's not, I mean, again, like in my dental school, I was one of the bigger guys, but right, <laughs> among bodybuilders, right. not so much. Um, but man, I was soft. I mean, I was absolutely soft. And I look at those pictures, I'm like, oof. And I mean, I was the strongest I'd ever been, which was cool, but I was pretty soft. And, 
what I noticed is I, you know, I held it for a little while. And by the time I had cut down back to like 190, I was a better, like slightly better 190 than I was before. But by the time I got back down to like 180 to get like my leanest, it, it kind of had just washed out. <laughs> and that's mm-hmm. kind of where I was like, okay, I'm, I'm kind of done. Because at that point I was like, okay, I'm either, I'm spending 80% of the year either grossly full or starving from the bulk and cutting. And I just bulked up 40 pounds and then held it and cut back down and I didn't really net anything. So I'm like, at that point, like, I guess I, in a way, I almost wanted to show myself, like I put in every possible thing I could. And as, as Dante said, like I've gone to the well and back and like, I just, I've, I've done everything. And mm. seeing that I didn't really net anything, it was like, okay, you know, I'm, I, I can more mentally accept that like I've done it. But like, to your point, I still, a lot of my bulks, I've gotten fairly soft. And of course I, I do want abs. I mean, um, I don't know if you see my Instagram at all recently, but I just posted like a little before and after of my current cut. And in the picture, my after looks way better. Now in person, of course, I'm smaller. You know, I, I, after the pandemic, I get back to the office and like I, I work with like 30 women and they're like, oh, you lost all this weight. Like you look skinny. And I was like, thanks. But, but Usually you know. Women like that better though. That's more attractive. I would say to the average woman, you know, thinner probably. and leaner. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I, I do prefer and, you know, my post-workout pumps look cool now, you know, the leaner I get and everything. So I would agree right. with you that I, I really do think a lot of people need to push their body fat more than they're comfortable with at times to maximize progress as fast as possible. But I also think most people do want, I mean, you know, like you said, it's bodybuilding, you know, most people do want to stay reasonably aesthetic most of the time. Yeah. And, and it's, and because, I mean, we'll just kind of tie it to the day's current climate because like really what's what's shaping your perspective on like what the path is like what what are the best what are the the guys doing that I that I want to be sort of a part of the tribe the tribe of bodybuilding is Instagram our Instagram right, heroes yeah. and they're all they all have really good genetics and they're, and they're sh- and the, the guys are shredded et cetera et cetera and go back 20 years when that, none of that was around and right. you know if you're like like I used to love there are some power lifters back in Tucson that I used to love to go like go out to we go to the buffets and eat and those guys right. didn't give a rat's ass like right and I like power lifters I love their attitude because they just want to just get as big and fucking strong as possible yeah and imagine you're a bodybuilder and they're like giving you shit for being small all the time because they know it'll get you and that's what the guys right. would do because a lot of power lifters are very big dudes they don't care about the fatness there, there's going to be nothing in your mind thinking oh my gosh I need to be leaner yeah. um, whatsoever and you take a totally different uh, mentality and and here's the thing we I think we've talked about this before, but there's there's and I who knows there's probably some variation in the the time the time course of epigenetic changes. But take someone let's just take an extreme circumstance where someone spends let's say you wanted to be a heavyweight powerlifter like you got into powerlifting like full bore yeah you, it all of a sudden like this bodybuilding I don't care about any of that you just want to get as strong and big as possible. And for the next 10 years, you started working your way up to, to where you got pretty close or maybe even became, got elite status. Like you're, you're shooting for like a 2,000 pound total or something like that. Mm-hmm. And you spent 10 years doing it. And you got strong as shit. Like, you know, you're, you're repping now two and a quarter for sets of 15 on overhead press because you've, you've gone to 220 and then to 230 and now you start hanging around with these friggin' monsters and they're all just big bloated guys and they're eating Chinese buffets and putting mayo on everything and, right. you know, drinking only sodas and the whole kit and caboodle. And, you, you know, assuming your health, t- you know, doesn't go to shit doing this. And you spend a decade doing that and you become r- ridiculously strong. You get pretty fat. But I think that could possibly happen with the right circumstances. And there may be some epigenetic changes that occur there, too. But certainly you'd have been handling some pretty heavy loads and gotten stronger and I think this is true for me. This is not the pot calling the kettle black, but you would very likely have gotten stronger and perhaps even gain more muscle mass than if you had diet down every year for, for the summertime or what have you. You mean diet, you'd have more muscle mass by the time you got back down to a reasonable level? Yeah, like, diet. yeah, well, by the, yes. One of the, so you, now you spend like three years dieting down. You say, okay, I'm going to yeah. stop powerlifting. You're still hanging with those guys, but you want to. And I know a guy, um, uh, I'm blanking on his name right now, is a great guy that, who, who works for Elite FTS. He set world records in the bench press, and he got so big. He knew like this interstitial leverage was the thing, and he was big and bloated. His face looked like it was about to uh, like explode at all times, and now he's dieted himself down to like single percentage body fat. 
Yeah. And he doesn't have like a great structure for bodybuilding, but he just he looks like he's a fucking machine. Yeah. You know, he's got that like like Dan Green is a guy, you know, who's strong as hell. He's just he's just naturally lean, I think. He's got that look like and he's this guy's strong as shit. It's because mm-hmm. he is strong as shit. You can see it in his physique. But he spent like he was I think I don't know, I I can't recall. I would imagine there probably was I mean his he looked like his blood pressure could have been three hundred over two hundred just sitting yeah. there. It was like not the healthiest thing, and that may have been why you know he decided to change change his, his trajectory. I think so, that's definitely true, especially for a lot of these guys, like I said, who are afraid to put on body fat. I do think that's true. If we're talking about doing this naturally, which is obviously a big caveat, um, I, I think to some extent that could happen. I think when I pushed myself up to 220 and, and hung out there for a while, I mean, that was kind of my point in doing that was to see. Now, again, it wasn't 10 years. I also think that, you know, I wasn't that much stronger at that weight. And I would question, like, I don't think it would be physically possible for me to ever get to like 225 or 15 overhead pressures. I know those are some example, but like, yeah. you know, there's a point where I just wouldn't get that much stronger. And I, and I do know people who have bulked up and weighed 250, 280, you know, even naturally. And by the time they get really lean, they're still not that much bigger than other naturals. Like if you know Alberto Nunez from 3DMJ, Mm -hmm. he was hovering around like 230, 240. He competes now at 165. Um, I just, I I really think that there's a point where you just don't get that much stronger. I mean, I have probably 95% of my strength now at 185 compared to 215, you know, for a lot of things. So um, I, I think the principle of bulking up for a long time, holding it, and then eventually cutting down is very sound. Obviously, I think there's limits to it. Right, yeah. I, I, I wonder, like, we haven't, I, I wonder to what extent in the natural bodybuilding community we don't get some of the prime genetics um, for being monstrously, monstrously large. And I'm thinking, like, there was a news story, maybe you saw this, there's a, um, a Chinese man, a man in China who gained... 225 pounds in five months during Holy the pandemic. Shit. Yeah, like he was hidden locked away. Oh my gosh. Um, like, so he gained like your max body weight in five months, <laughs> like on top of his body. And he was a big guy before that. That's insane. So, you know, I don't know if he had a tumor, like that just, you know, in his lateral hypothalamus or what brought that <laughs> on. But like, I, you would think he's just got to have extraordinary genetics to put on tremendous amount of size. <laughs> yeah. And I don't imagine a lot of that was muscle mass. Right, right. But, like, but there's a person with, you know, who's on the outer end of the, of the spectrum. So, um, yeah, it's hard, it's, hard, it's hard to say because most pro bodybuilders are spending a lot of time diet. And there's a limit. Obviously, it's very different. You yeah. can look at guys like, like Ronnie Coleman. Claims he was. He was, like, 229 when he got yeah. his pro card. And then he, he was... He put on, uh, you know, 65 pounds, right, of, right? you know, at this peak. So it's, you know. And I will two- say, um, I do think, like, you know, we're talking natural versus enhanced here. I do believe that for enhanced guys who blast gear for many years and go up to 280, 300, whatever, I do think that even if they go back to, like, low levels of TRT, um, and you've seen this with guys like Dante and Meadows and things like that, I do think that they can maintain way more size than they ever could have naturally. And I would suspect even coming off completely, I know guys like Ken Skip Hill have said that there's a huge difference for them between coming off completely and even like low dose TRT. But even if they came off completely, I suspect they'd still, I mean, there's no way like Dante still sits around at like a relatively lean 260 on low dose TRT. Mm. I'm sure if he came off, he'd lose quite a bit of size, but he'd still be significantly bigger than he could have been naturally. So I do think when you're enhanced, whatever mechanisms are going on there, whether it's satellite cell proliferation or whatever is happening, I do think you are pushing past boundaries. And that's been demonstrated. There's, an, there's a rodent study where, where they use steroids during a um, compensatory overload model. And then they took the animals off that and then they reloaded them again and the growth was faster. And they've connected mm-hmm. that with epigenetics. And there's, a, there's actually a researcher he was on my podcast. I'm blank on his name right now. He's got a study that is, I think they've, they finished collecting. They've been doing collecting um, data in waves and doing biopsies. I think they're also doing some free body composition, um, skin folds, maybe a bod pot or a dex. I can't remember exactly, but he's, uh, he's collecting. 
they're collecting muscle biopsies and doing an epigenetic analysis on natural competitors, competitors who have used and come off. He's like even looking at, you know, guys who can give them some idea of a documentation as to what they used and then people are coming on and off. Mm. Um, so awesome. they're, so they can measure changes in this. So yeah, that's, that's the thing is that it, it does. And that's why natural organizations, you know, I think I've seen up like up to seven years, you know, yeah. you have to have demonstrated something like that. Yeah. There's, there's definitely an advantage there without a doubt. Sure. Those satellite cells tend to persist. Those yeah. stay for a long period of time. They don't just like, you know, cause it's a, it's a major overhaul to bring in a new nucleus to govern yeah. an area in a muscle cell. It's not like, you know, just, you and know, I would wonder how much the time spent on gear has to do with it. I mean, like I have a friend who is in med school and he used, he did one or two cycles, looked awesome. And mm -hmm. then he came off and I think he kind of was like depressed afterwards. And so he just pretty much stopped lifting and he looked like trash afterwards. Like he lost everything. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And now when he lifts, he doesn't look anything like when he was on gear. And I'd say he probably looks about the same as when, like before he was ever on gear. Um, mm -hmm. I, I would, imagine that while people could say oh you know because i do think people go the other extreme they think oh you know you use something one time you had this amazing advantage over other naturals and i'm like dude like i know plenty of people who have done a couple of cycles or one cycle and they get trounced by other naturals like i've just i've seen it time and time again and they yeah. they don't look that impressive i mean tons of people i know so that's different than i think these guys like i said dante meadows these guys doing it for like a decade or more pushing very high body weight. So I don't want people to think, I also don't, I don't want people to think that, Hey, I can do one cycle and then I'm going to have this genetic, like this great advantage right. forever. Just like that's just, yeah. Right. Like yeah. that is not going to happen, you know? So uh, that, that's really not what we're talking about. Well, there, there's, the, that's the thing is there's going to be variations in the extent to which those epigenetic changes happen and the extent to which you see the satellite cell proliferation increase in satellite cell density. So like that, that we know from the studies right. looking at, dividing people up into res levels of responsiveness. So um, someone, for instance, who is, tends to grow really well and gets great satellite cell proliferation, no gear involved whatsoever, they're going to have an advantage when they come back to start to lift. And right. that's probably, an, they had an advantage to start with, which, it was, which you see the first time they train. And then when they, when they come back, they have that advantage in terms of regaining muscle they previously had. Right. Um, so, and then the other hand, like your buddy who was in med school, who looked really good when he was on and not so much, I mean, he may be hypogonadal now. He may have like, you know, he, he may have gone from a test level of seven or 800, which was sort of normal at the time. And now he's hovering around four or five and he's a physician. It's like, well, I'm still in the normal range. Right. I'm good to go. It's like, no, your testosterone is 400. It used to be 800. It's half as much. There's, there's, you're on, you're on the, on the yeah. slant there, the dose response curve and you're at the low end now. Well, that could be vegan part of it. and he can't grow facial hair so you know whatever uh, that says <laughs> oh okay there's some other things at play you know yeah he, his pendulums he went from you know geared up going for it and now he's like at right. the other end like yeah right. he's got no creatine in his body at all right, right? so but the but the responsiveness to gear also varies so you know people yeah. talk about kevin Lavroni and great genetics there's probably some overlap in the in the pathways that are involved because the muscles growing it's getting stronger in both cases but you know, a antigen sensitive sensitivity. We know in the genetics there, there's um, at least one sequence of, of repeats in the gene that varies from like, um, it's a CAG repeat that codes for glutamine. It varies from like eight to like 27. Mm. And the, the length of that repeat changes the shape of the antigen receptor and that dictates antigen receptor sensitivity to antigens. And this has been studied in the context of prostate cancer. And what you see is in black Americans and African Americans, which, whatever they've been called in the study, right. um, you see a higher rate of prostate cancer. And that is, is a function, at least to some degree, of right. the antigen receptor. So they study that. So that's, that's something, too. So all the, the transduction that may happen there that bring, upon, bring about growth and maybe even evoke some epigenetic changes that persist, aside from the satellite cells, could make one person who grows like a weed from gear someone who's going to hold on to those gains much better than someone else. Right. So it's like literally like the sliding scale, like this giant equalizer for all the different things that can, that can happen as an acute or sort of a chronic response while exposed to the training or the, the pharmaceutical in this case, and then the epigenetics and whatever other changes like satellite cells, 
that dictate permanency of that change. Um, you know, it's funny, like there was a, there's another example. There was a woman, and I remember um, she was asking Alan Aragon and myself, we were in Colorado, we'd done a seminar out there, and she tends to have a hard time gaining weight, but she doesn't get fat in the off-season, but she has a really hard time losing body fat and getting really lean. Mm. And like, she's like, oh my gosh, and immediately I'm like, well, you just happen to have the genetics that, that really uh, guard against changes in that body right. fat set point or settling point in both directions. Like you right. don't tend to be lean and get lean easily or you can't get fat to save your life. It's like both ways yeah. just wants to stick you there. So there's so many genetic variations that could explain all of this. And that's, that's the way I kind of look at this. And that's the thing we're – another topic um, I think maybe we're going to talk about. But it's, it's one of my um, – sort of my uh, hobby horse topics, I guess, is that studies and meta-analyses, like the, the idea of science is to be able to predict from the results of your, of your study what you'd expect in the population that you studied right. on average. And you look, the, the larger the variance in individuals, the less likely you are to see some difference um, when you're comparing groups. So that's why people would do an analysis of variance as a primary right. statistical method. I always sort of look at that like if you want to see here's like a visual that people can kind of think about so imagine you want to see if adding like a scope to a rifle makes you more accurate in shooting at a target so you shoot at the target a hundred times and you see like you know you're maybe you're off to the left and there's some scatter of the holes on the target away from the bullseye and and then you add the scope and now you get you centered somewhere else and which is still a huge scatter. Mm -hmm. So if there's a huge scatter, huge variance in both cases, you're not going to see any difference because right. they're like the holes are all over the place. But if they're really tightly scattered around the, a center point and you don't see a whole lot of overlap, that's less variance. And there's also a difference in the mean, which is where sort of the things are centered. Right. That's when you tend to see a difference. And that's great. That's what, you know, science is helping us in that regard to predict. But the thing that's important from an individual standpoint and a practical standpoint in many cases, and this is why this Domus research is so cool, when they compared averages at the, with the different training frequencies, didn't matter. Right, No right. difference. But when they looked at the individuals, holy shit. Absolutely. Some people, get, they're getting totally different storylines as to what their best way to train is. And that's why, and so this was asked to me in an, another podcast too, is like, so what do you, like, what do you think the best way to look at things that are from an evidence-based perspective is? Is like, well, recognize what the real power of your evidence is. Are you, trying to, are you trying to gain insights as to what an individual might do? Or are you trying to get insights as to what the average person might do? So if you've got a, 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 cl a gym class with kids who are training for the first time, like, you just want to toss out a generic prescription for all of them, well, you know, you could come up with that perhaps from some study that looked into that. But if you're trying to figure out how to get an individual to grow the best, you take a very careful case history. You figure out what's worked. Have you tried DC training? Did you like DC training? Have you tried volume training? How sore do you get? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Because you could be an outlier in those studies. And if you just believe the mean, the mean values from the studies, it would say frequency doesn't matter. But if you look at the individuals of those studies, you get a entirely different picture. Sure. And that's, sure. that's the beauty of like the, when they're doing this now. So back in the day, like studies, you know, from the early 1900s where you had just, they put initials next to the, the, the dots in the, in the plots that were yeah. usually hand drawn. And those initials match the author's initials because they, they, they had limited resources. And now when you see these individual dots, that's badass because you, yeah. you actually can see those things. And, and hopefully they don't throw out outliers and not make note of that. But sometimes right. the outliers are the ones that's like, so why is this person an outlier? Yeah. What's going on with that? And can we take that information and then use that in a quote unquote clinical or a practical in the trenches way to say, okay, this person has this happening with them. Like they never get sore no matter how much they do and they grow like weeds. Right. Maybe there's something to learn from that. You know, maybe getting sore is, or not being sore, training such as you don't get extraordinarily sore could be a key to better muscle growth. So that was a bit of a ramble, but that's no, an important thing good. when it comes to it comes to looking at the literature and applying it is that the meat you don't want to be average. bodybuilders don't want to be average. Sure. You want to be outstanding. 
you want to be exceptional. So you want to look to the exceptions of the quote unquote black swans right. is the term, the outliers. That's, that's maybe more important for, for those people who want to be uh, jaw dropping Do when you, they're walking around. You know, like we're talking about a lot of individual variation here. We talked before about getting weird with exercises. I think probably one example of somebody who maybe had a relatively weak body part and brought it up a lot was Dusty Hanshaw on his back. Um, right. But I was just wondering if you had any specific examples of somebody who, and Meadows talks about this too. I don't know if looking at his old pictures, if I agree, he had like a weak back. Um, if you if you continued reading the thread with Dante, I was talking about my calves and how like, you know, I just accept it at this point, they won't grow. Right. It's, it's almost comical. Um, but have you seen some clear examples where it's like somebody is really training correctly, meaning they are going for progressive overload. They are sticking with like the core exercises and by switching to some unique exercise they weren't doing, they were really able to bring up a weak body part. And just, this could just be examples that you've seen. You know, I, I know I, you, you said, you told me you're going to ask this question and I, I, I did this with my hamstrings years ago. Yeah. Um, and I remember, um, what was her name? There was a woman, uh, at this was, this is even before I met, this may have been before I met Dave. This was a long, and, and this, so this was, I was doing a lot of the things that Dante um, has people do before I started doing, before I even found DC training. That's why it resonated so much with me. Um, and I had, I had competed for the very first time, I think, in Arizona. And this competitor, she'd previously won the North Americans in mixed pairs. Um, and she was maybe in her 40s, something like that. But she'd been around a long time. And she just, you know, say it like it is, shot it at me. It's like, you, your hamstrings are really weak. You need to bring up your hamstrings. And like, I took that to heart. Like that resonated with me. She was like right at this. Like, it was like basically Mr. Mr. Ego got poked really, really hard there. Yeah. And um, she said, do you do a lot of stiff legged deadlifts? And I'm like, I don't, I do them, but I like, I haven't really focused on them. And I just made that my mission to get really, really good at doing those. And I, and I got to where I was doing those with four or five for sets of 10 all the way to the floor with good control with, with knees just barely bent. And my hamstrings came up substantially. But so now that's probably more an example, less so of, you know, finding these strange exercises and more taking an exercise we know to be good and hammering away at it. So did you just yeah. do it more often, more frequency, more volume? I, I just started making, that was, that became like my, I think I was doing that. Well, I know that was part of my DC rotation without a doubt. I was adding that in and I start and I just started doing that with the, with the intent of getting as strong as possible. In, in that. So for me, that was, it wasn't, so the principle of getting funky with or getting weird with it is to find an exercise you haven't been doing and focusing on. Right. And I just, you know, I think some of my thought was like, there's no knee, there's no knee flexion here. So it's not going to be the best one. You know, obviously the, the hamstrings cross both the hips and the knees. Sure. Um, so, but I just, just didn't think about that. And I was using, I figured I'm getting hamstrings when I when I train my back as well, so I don't want to overtrain them, et cetera, et cetera. But I just turned, I just made that a primary focus in a way I never had. And, and she sort of confirmed that I trusted her opinion because she'd been around, like literally she had won the North Americans, it was mixed pairs, but yeah. you know, that was the time when, you know, they were giving out, you know, just pro cards to like the overall winners at the USA's and the nationals. So right. she would have been a pro. She would have easily been like a women's physique pro nowadays. No problem. Even, so other even years later. Other than just like mentally, you you were like, okay, I'm going to start caring about this exercise. But was there something you did differently in terms of execution? Was there more volume? Was there more frequency? Like, what did you actually change compared to what you were doing before? I I wanted to get as brutally strong on that exercise. That's why I said, you know, sets. Of, I could do ten with four or five. Yeah. So I focused on making sure the range of motion was full, and that I just got crazy strong on that exercise. I mean, I was. It's one of it's. I wasn't this bad, but like, and it, here's an example. This will maybe resonate with with you. So a lot of people will do like shrugs. You see people doing shrugs with, like, one thirty five. You know, mm -hmm. or like the sixty pound dumbbells or something like that. It's like, you, you should you can at least do shrugs with the weight you deadlift. Yeah. In most cases, if not much more. I mean, you can get really sloppy and just do you know be really asinine with your shrugs. But I wasn't. I wasn't really. I wasn't. I was taking. I was using it sort of like almost like a fluff exercise in a way. I wasn't okay. really using it as a, this is the one that's going to make my hamstrings grow. So okay. I'd put it in there, um, but I wasn't like pushing because stiff legged deadlifts are it's there. It's a form of deadlifts. Those are hard as shit. Yeah. So I prioritized that. I think I was doing it first. 
Okay. Um, at before I so there's some there's some of the period there it was over several years when I started when I did that and some of that time I wasn't doing DC training and so it was this was like 2004. But I just know I just haven't ha, remember having that in my mind and I remember putting four plates on there and I literally is one of those. There's, you know, some workouts that just stand out in your mind. It's like this was mm-hmm. just, I remember doing 405 for 10 and, and you know, recognizing. And, and I could like, sit on a bench and look in the mirror and my hamstring was just like, like, yeah. like, like, like horse balls. Like, it wasn't yeah. quite John Meadows level, but right. it was that kind of idea. And that was not, I mean, literally my hamstring was just flat. It was like, it was just, obviously it was, it was weak to me. All right. You could, I would get in shape on stage. So, you know, I could do a rear double back and that sort of thing. You would see, you'd see the lineation and separation in my hamstring. When I turned to the side, there was nothing there. And so I got so better. At posing a lot of it was like you were, it sounds like maybe you didn't change the frequency and volume that much, but you were just pushing the exercise a lot harder. I, I just, I mean, that exercise, I don't even remember it being like a mainstay in my, I was just doing yeah. hamstring curls okay. for the most part. I mean, I think I would, I think I, I really wasn't. I started doing that every every training session. I made that, mm-hmm. and then of course DC training. You wouldn't do it every training session, but right. I was I was I was also doing, and this is part of DC training. I, I was also doing like high. We do the high high leg press to get more posterior to get the hamstrings involved. So I was right. I did that, but the main thing was the stiff legged deadlifts. I I made that my personal mission. And yeah. so I can't I can't I wish I could dissect the details. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I would be just bullshitting you if I like told you like I knew I went. For, yeah. I didn't. I may have the logbooks back in my back in yeah. the buried in a box somewhere. When I was but home that was with that. all the, the what's that? that? That's when I was home with all like the quarantine stuff. I found my old because I, I have all my workouts written like on my computer, so I can just search them back to about two thousand and nine. Mm. But I have written ones back from two thousand five, right. and like my little notes in there, like yelling at the <laughs> nonsense, like yeah. oh, I touched the bar. You know, I'm like sixteen years old. It's, it's yes. so funny to see those are still there. Oh, I have I have little notes too. You know, like um, yeah. last rep was sloppy, that kind of thing. Yeah, 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 right. Um, I you know I have I have a client who um, he's been training through the pandemic. This he's in the UK, and um, his back has grown tremendously. And he hasn't really gained that much weight, to be honest. We're, we're pushing the weight, and he's been able to rest. So some of this is just being able to rest and kick back and relax more so. But he has limited equipment, so he's just he's been doing full deads yeah. and stiff-legged deadlifts. He's just he's been doing, and his back has come up. Nice. And he wasn't even really aware of it so much, but he just has he's just cut out the fluff exercises. Right. And and that was what for him it was. I want to. I need to go and get the. I mean, I saw it immediately. I'm. He did a check in. I'm like, I'm like, hold on. Is this because because he had been he couldn't check into the gym anymore, and he did a check in. And I think he maybe missed one or he changed positions. He did one. The lighting was bad. We're trying to figure out the best spot. Okay. So he came back to me and I'm like, okay, your back looks. What the hell happened to your back? Like, what's going on? He's like, not. What do you mean? I'm like, your back has just like grown by leaps and bounds. And all he did was he just was doing lots. He's doing a lot of deadlifts, ah, and, awesome. and he wasn't. Try, he was doing those somewhat, but they weren't. He just had no choice but to deadlift because he only had so much stuff. I so, would wonder because um, you know talking about like I have a few friends who we either like chat on Instagram or you know through text, and a lot of us really do prefer that. I don't know if it's old school, but like it's hard for me to get behind like the high volume three RIR type of training. It, it's not as exciting to me. I, I just had it so ingrained in my mind to like beat the logbook. Mm. And in theory, knowing in a way that like I'm not growing anymore, it's like, why wouldn't you prefer like the easier training of like keeping some of the tank? But I just like the, okay, like even like with cardio, if I can do 10 sprints or 40 minutes of moderate intensity, like I, I want to do 10 sprints, go right. hard and go home. So it's funny because I've actually never done DC training. I've read about it so much, but I never actually really? have done it. Right. Dude. I, I was going to, and then I did four, you came along with four, two training. I was like, well, this is like DC plus almost. I <laughs> know so, uh, you should do DC still. Well, so I'm going to, and, and that's Good. what actually I was going to ask you. Um, now that gyms are open up, I obviously can't do it with, with the home workouts, but you know, you need a fair amount of equipment. So I am going to do it because wh- why not finally try it? Right. Um, a little worried about the intensity, you know, with my heart issues, but I think mm. as long as I like don't Valsalva and, and things like that, like I, I the Widowmakers would, would worry me, but for most things, I think I'll be okay. Um, but I was going to ask you actually, so, you know, I'm, as you, you know, my history pretty well at this point, 
I'm still planning on sticking with like the two way split. I'm mm -hmm. basically just going to do it as if I'm a beginner to DC. Um, I might, I guess I'll add those pulses that you were talking about. Cause I wasn't, I was just thinking of just doing the regular, like the three RP sets and then a stretch. But would you right. recommend doing those pulses pretty much for every exercise then? Um, how do you feel your recovery is? Are you, do you feel like you could recover from, I mean, if you were to go in and do like five sets to failure, is, what would you typically do in a workout and how would that compare to the DC rest pause with the pulses? So, yeah, this is, this is a question that's literally, which might sound ridiculous for how long I've trained, but to say like what's worked for me, I honestly feel like most things kind of work similarly for me. Like I okay. said, when I did that, that um, pull-up specialization, my pull-ups actually, it was probably too much pull-ups because those didn't go up that much. I maybe gained 10 pounds on my one max because it was doing them so much. Um, but back went up, but then so did my pecs. I will say, and again, nothing against Meadows, the one time that I was like, wow, I just did like a routine for three months while bulking and like I did not get any good results was when I did John Meadows intermediate routine that he put on uh, mm -hmm. T Nation. And it was a lot of, you know, out there exercises, exercise that I hadn't done. So I was getting stronger, but after mm -hmm. 12 weeks, man, like my arms were the same size, my waistline was up, I was kind of just fatter. So maybe not great response to like higher volume, I don't think. Um, just mentally, I think I kind of jive with the lower volume, high intensity. I'll tell you now, like my volume is quite low. I, right now I do an upper, lower, upper, and it's literally three sets per muscle group. That's it. So basically my upper is, um, I'll do three sets of biceps, three sets of triceps, three sets of chest, three sets of shoulders, and then six back, you know, three horizontal, three vertical. And I'll do that twice a week. So technically I'm only doing six to eight work sets per muscle group right now. And I've maintained almost all of my size and strength during this cut. So if that tells you anything, okay. you know. I was mainly thinking like how sore do you get? You know, you think you'd just be obliterated by that. Would your nervous system get, get torched? Um, I would just add it in there, throw it in and you can pull it off if you need to. Yeah. Are you gonna Are you gonna eat as Dante would suggest? Well, that's the other thing. So I'm getting to the leanest. I'll send you a picture. Um, I'm getting to the leanest that I've been, mm -hmm. and um, because of my GI issues, I don't plan to ever really bulk up. So once I get down to like 180, I was thinking of like slowly bulking up to 190. But I, I certainly won't be doing any like you know bulk up to the heaviest I've been or anything like that. So let's say uh -huh. a very moderate surplus. Can you, can you, like, is there a way you can use timing and take in, like, one or two sizable meals and the rest of the time the meals are much smaller and, and your G will, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, you could just try to try to do that. I mean, that's. Yeah, I can, can definitely have a sur surplus. It's just, you know, I don't, just because of where I'm at now, I don't even think it would be overly effective to have, like, a huge surplus. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'd be okay with going from that 180 to maybe 190, but that might be over the course of you know, months, of course, you know, right, so, right. So yeah, I'm just wondering if you like if you took, you know, had a 500 calorie a day surplus, if your GI would be better with 100 calories in each of five meals or mm. five a 500 all in one meal that you, yeah. you chose the foods and maybe the fiber and threw some probiotics in there or whatever countermeasures yeah. you may have come up with so that you can kind of put it all in one meal and then guard against any any disruption to your GI's yeah, homeostasis. Right. And the rest of the time, take it easy for recovery. So you only have like one, one every other day, one, three yeah. times a week. Well, my friend, you might find this interesting. My friend who, uh, natural lifter, who's, you know, bulked up, cut down, bulked up, cut down, very familiar with Dante. Um, he, at this point now, he's, he's a short guy and he maintains a quite lean, like 145 naturally. Mm -hmm. And I mean, he looks, he looks good. Um, what he does is he found that once he got to, that lean level, if he tried to just maintain on like 2,800 to 3,000 every day, mm -hmm. he felt like he was just never satiated and he didn't like it. And it like, cause he's trying to maintain pretty lean. What he's found is he does two to three low days and he'll then have a refeed. And every time right. he then baseline, so he's like refeed gets him up to 148 and then he'll lose like a pound a day, whatever. And then when he gets back to 145, he has another refeed. He's mm -hmm. found this to be a very enjoyable way to maintain that very lean level. And he says that he finds that on his lower days, his skin feels better. You know, he just seems to have like, you know, those anti-inflammatory effects. Like he just mm -hmm. feels better. And I've kind of considered that of like, okay, if I have three days of like perfect diet, you know, uh, low volume, things that I know work well for my stomach, 
and then once every three or four days, which maybe could be like the three days I work out on DC training, you know, or maybe two of those days, two of my more important days, whatever, right. I have higher calories. I don't know if you've heard of people like kind of doing that cyclical, you know, oh, yeah. you're, here for, you're here for cutting, of course, all the time. Right. But, you know, for bulking where it's almost like, okay, I'm eating like foods that really agree with me for three days in a row ish, you know, two to three days in a row yeah. and then a higher day. I feel like that might you know it's almost like like you were saying like that time to recover before sure. i then kind of like insult saying, yeah. again 